My name is Amanda Fabe, and I am CBS Class of 2021. On behalf of the Student Leadership and Ethics Board of the Sanford C. Bernstein and Company Center for Leadership and Ethics and the Military and Business Association, welcome to the Leadership and Ethics Military and Business Speaker Series featuring retired Lieutenant General Thomas Bostick. This annual event highlights the intersection of military service and business by hosting military veterans turned business leaders who reflect on how their service has impacted their leadership style organizations they serve, and society at large. This series is made possible by the generous support of Robert Dow, class of 74, and Christina Dow. Before I turn it over to our moderator, I'd like to briefly introduce him. Jason Dempsey currently serves as the Interim Executive Director of Columbia's Center for Veteran Transition and Integration. One of the nation's leading experts on military demographics and civil military relations, he is a graduate of West Point and earned his doctorate in political science from Columbia University. He deployed in support of combat operations to Kuwait, Iraq, and Afghanistan, and served with prestigious units within the Army, such as the 82nd Airborne, 101st Airborne, 3rd Infantry Division, 10th Mountain Division, and the 75th Ranger Regiment, in addition to serving in the White House. Jason, thank you for your service and for moderating today's discussion. Over to you. Uh, thank you, everybody. It's great to be here. Um, you know, good afternoon to everybody who's joined us, students and alumni of Columbia Business School. Uh, you know, there's a tremendous community here, uh, as well as all the veterans and other interested parties have joined us today. Uh, I want to especially thank Olivia, Amanda, and Shirley for their great work in putting this event together uh, and for amplifying the voice of our guest. You know, Lieutenant General retired uh, Tom Bostic. Uh, Tom has a storied career uh, and has been a great mentor. Uh, to myself and others, uh, and he's frankly somebody that I personally put in the category of great Americans. He's a 1978 graduate of the United States Military Academy at West Point. Uh, he came into the Army of late 1970s, uh, which was one that was still rebuilding itself uh, from the tensions of the Vietnam era. He didn't plan to stay in the Army longer than his commitment of five years, uh, but ended up serving his nation for 38 years as an engineer. Uh, in addition to his usual military assignments, uh, including time in Bosnia and Iraq. General Bostic also served as White House Fellow with the Secretary of Veterans Affairs. Uh, and towards the end of his career, he took on the task of revamping Army recruiting, uh, you know, a daunting task uh, in the midst of ongoing conflicts. Uh, the pinnacle of his military career, he last served as the Chief of Engineers and Commanding General of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, luckily for us, uh, even though he is retired from the military, he has not stopped serving. Uh, and currently brings his leadership talents into the civilian sector, working in all places, primarily in biotech and bioengineering. Sir, Tom, I'm grateful for your leadership over the years that I've known you, uh, and especially grateful you could share a few words with us today. Thank you, Jason. I appreciate that kind of introduction. I also want to thank uh, Amanda, Olivia, um, and Shirley for all of their efforts uh, in bringing this together. When Amanda first reached out to me, I, I always wonder how, how people find me. So that was the first question I asked Amanda. And interestingly, she went to American Corporate Partners, the website, and I'm on the advisory board of American Corporate Partners. And the CEO uh, of American Corporate Partners is a guy named Sid Goodfriend. And Sid is a graduate of the Columbia Business School. So I thought it was pretty neat connection. So I've talked to Sid that I was going to be able to do this. And Sid is another uh, great, great American. I, I had a lot of uh, leaders come into my office, civilian leaders, when I was the head of personnel, uh, because the unemployment for veterans was so high. And, and Sid came in and he wanted to help me. And, and he's a retired investment banker. He was younger than me when he retired. I think he was in his 40s, but late 40s or early 50s. And he said he wanted to help. And I said, okay, Sid, well, how much money do I need to give you so that you can help me? And which was my normal question to all the CEOs. And he goes, I don't want any money. I said, really? I said, what do you want? I said, oh, I want a list of names of people that need mentors. And that's what I do. He has mentors like Rupert Murdoch and you, you know, you name it, that are in the corporate world that mentor veterans for a year. And all I had to do is give them a list. So Anyway, uh, Amanda, I'm on that advisory board or on that board of directors, and you found me, and I'm, I'm honored to be here today to be with you. 
And I also want to thank the, the veterans in the audience and, and those that uh, have touched veterans. Uh, as Jason said, I was the head of recruiting for the Army. And, and when I was in that job, I always thought that, you know, we, we enlist a soldier, we commission an officer, but we retain families. And anywhere along that career of, of a soldier, an officer, where it gets really difficult, uh, if they don't have the spouse support, the children support, the aunt and uncles, uh, the parents, uh, all of that support really matters. And uh, so, so all of those that have reached out and touched the lives of soldiers and veterans, I just want to thank you given yesterday was Veterans Day. And congratulations to Amanda and the other Marines in the, the group here that celebrated their birthday yesterday. So with that, Jason, I, I thank you and I look forward to the discussion. Well, thank you, Tom. I guess from the start of the beginning, um, you know, what led you uh, to the United States Military Academy you know, in the mid seventies and eventually your career as an engineering officer in the army, right? Did, speaking of family, uh, did you have a family legacy of service and uh, what was it that you know, brought you to the Hudson? Well, uh, it's a great question, and I reflect on that, and, and it's part of the reason I like speaking to schools and students, uh, because of my, my own close opportunity of, of not getting to college. It, it, it looked really dicey for me. My, my mother and father, um, they met in Japan. My mother's Japanese. My dad was in the Army, but he was orphaned when he was eight years old, so he worked in Brooklyn. Back in those days, in the refrigerators, you had to carry ice. So he would carry ice up and down these <laughs> apartment complexes. He said, since he was eight years old, it sounds like child labor. So I don't know if it was legal back then, but he always reminded me that he started working at eight years old. So uh, he was enlisted. He came into an army that was segregated. So he worked in the black units, met my mother, who's Japanese. The two of them married, you know, a little after World War II, which made it really challenging, you know, for an African-American and a Japanese and to be married during that difficult time. But um, they had five children. And uh, my brother is an artist. Um, my sister uh, is just, I'm the second one. My sister uh, went to Bolt Law School. My next brother is a veterinarian. And my youngest brother is uh, a cancer surgeon. So, so my parents really wanted us to go to school. Uh, they, they both graduated from high school, but didn't have the opportunity to go to college. And when I was in high school, my first brother went to art school. Um, I worked three jobs in order to help him get through art school. Uh, and I just, I said, I can't do that to my sisters and brothers. I, I have to find a scholarship. So, um, so I thought about applying to West Point because I had a buddy that applied to West Point. I wasn't like a number of the kids today that were so patriotic that, that and there was a war going on and they wanted to serve. I just wanted to go to college. And so anyway, I, you, have, you have to not only have the grades and the physical um, fitness, but you have to have a, a nomination from a member of Congress. So um, I, I just moved from Japan, uh, landed in California, applied for this nomination, and, and I got a letter. <laughs> I still have the letter. In fact, I have it framed, and, and it's from my senator. That, and, and it starts off, uh, I regret to inform you. And, you, you know, and then I got a second letter like that from my other senator. And I got a third one from my congressman, my local congressman. So no one in this audience is probably old enough to know Shirley Chisholm. But Shirley Chisholm was the, the congresswoman from Brooklyn. So we're living in California. And I decided to write to her. And I said, Congresswoman Chisholm, I'm out here in Monterey, California, trying to go to West Point, and my dad grew up in Brooklyn. He started working when he was eight years old, and I'm just hoping he'll give me a nomination at West Point. And she wrote back to me, I'm sorry to inform you, but you have to live in Brooklyn in order for me to nominate you. So I took three uh, woodworking uh, classes in, in high school, so I just decided I'd be a carpenter. And I applied to the to the community college, which was basically free, and I was going to be a carpenter. And one day, um, 
a guy named General Wall, Brigadier General George Wall, from the class of 1917 at West Point. He shows up at my high school and he says, Tom, I understand you want to go to West Point. I said, I used to want to go to West Point. He goes, well, what's the problem? And I said, I, I can't get a nomination. I've got a lot of I regret to inform you letters. And, and he says, well, um, why don't you write a letter to the president? And I said, you're a general, right? And he said, yes. I said, I just told you I can't get a letter from a congressman or a senator. Now you want me to write the president. <laughs> and he said, I know it doesn't make sense, but he said, the president has 100 nominations for the kids of the military. And I wrote to the president and boom, <laughs> I got into West Point. <laughs> so, um, you know, the, the thing I wanted to tell the audience about this is, General Wall, um, he he got me, he, you know, he, he told, taught me about this. He mentored me. And I've always thought about this Nelson Henderson quote. He was a farmer. And he said, the true meaning in life is to plant trees under whose shade you do not expect to sit. And I graduated from West Point in, the, in 1978. And General Wall died in 1981. So we had no idea where I was going to go and what I was going to do, but he thought it was important enough to, to come to this school and talk to me. And, and, and that's why I think, you, you know, my effort to come back to schools like Columbia and, and I, I teach fourth grade because my wife is, was an elementary school principal. So that for some reason, that was the grade I always get was to go in there and teach engineering and math in the hope that I can make a difference. And, and again, you know, kids are gonna grow up and do a lot of things that you may never know about, but I think each of us that have been given opportunities owe it to society and, and our fellow men and women to, to give back. That's a long answer to a short no, question. That's, that's exactly what we wanted to hear. You know, the, uh, uh, interestingly, it's, uh, you know, a somewhat circuitous route, um, to West Point, but it also kind of reflects uh, a somewhat unconventional career after you graduated. I guess the, you know, you spent 38 years making it to the pinnacle of a, you know, a very large organization. Um, did you plan to become the chief of engineers? And, you know, what was, what was most expected and what was least expected, I guess, about your navigation of, you know, your army career? That's a great question. Um, let me let me first tell you a little bit about what Jason did in the military. He did what I thought I was going to do. I I love the Rangers. I love that Ranger Regiment. It, it is one of the most elite units in our army. A lot of folks talk about the SEALs, but you, and you've got special forces and you've got these Rangers. And and I just adored the Ranger Regiment where where Jason served, and and I adored the infantry. And um, my dad, you, you know, let me back up to West Point. When it, I, I was pretty good in math. And I didn't realize at West Point, when I got there, you only had four electives. <laughs> you know, you, could you imagine going to a school, showing up, and you have four electives in four years? So whether you liked it, you took electrical engineering, fluid dynamics, thermodynamics, differential equations, partial different, you just did all that, chemistry, physics, but you also took the liberal arts. So I was fortunate enough that there was a lot of math and I was good at that so that, that I could do well. Um, but I, I did something in my second year, after my second year, they picked 25 cadets to go to ranger school. And they don't do this anymore. Jason, I don't know if they did it when you were there, but did, did they send the cadets to ranger school when you were there? Occasionally, but it was fewer and fewer and fewer, like one or two a year. So they sent 25 of us and we all graduated. And these guys are my best friends in life. And, uh, and, and almost every one of them went infantry. And back then you would stand up uh, in class rank from one to a thousand and you'd say your branch. And so I was, I was wrestling between engineers and infantry. And when my name came up, I, I said, engineers. And part of this, Jason, is I thought I was going to get out of the army. And, and I just thought that I can. The other thing is, I said, I, 
you know, I can go with the engineers and if I don't like it, then I can transfer into the infantry. So um, I was in the army for about six months and I started my effort to transfer into the infantry. I hated what I, I hated what I was doing, but it wasn't it wasn't my unit, and it wasn't the engineers. It was that the drug problem was so bad, and we had we had back then we had soldiers that signed their name with an X. I, I mean, it was really hard to believe the situation that we were in with the educational challenges. The the drug challenges. So I wanted to. I wanted to get to the Ranger Regiment. I was. So I applied, uh, and and I learned something that I couldn't leave the engineer branch because there weren't enough officers in the engineer branch, and there were too many officers in the infantry branch. So then Special Forces opened up, became a branch. I tried to switch to that, and and they didn't let me, let me move. So I ended up getting a battalion commander. His name was uh, Lieutenant Colonel Daniel Chrisman. And he, he kind of changed my life. I mean, and these mid-level leaders are so important. It's kind of the first leader that a new lieutenant will work with, a first senior kind of leader. But he's still, you have a lieutenant colonel, then you have colonel, then one star, two star, three star, four star. He eventually became a three star in the head of West Point, the superintendent of West Point. Uh, he was he was just brilliant. He, he and he just motivated people to stay in. And, and to this day, he's a, a, a great mentor. But in terms of my career, um, my wife says it best. He says it's good that you never had a choice in what you were going to do. That people always kind of told me this is what you ought to go do next. And you know, I like anybody else had ambitions to do different things. And a job would come up and I'd kind of hope I'd get it, but I was never the kind of person that would say, you know, you know, I really want to go do that. So um, one of the bigger surprises for me was when I got into the personnel. So, so I went to Iraq and I was there for about 15 months and I came back and they made me the number two guy in the Corps of Engineers. So now I was a two star, I was the number two guy in the Corps of Engineers. And uh, we bought a house and my wife got a job as a principal. And to get a job as a principal in Arlington County or Fairfax County here in DC is really hard because you're always moving around and, and they just don't know if you're gonna be there that long. So she got a job as a principal, we bought a house. And then 45 days later, I, I got a call that, you know, they have a branch in the Pentagon that manages the generals and it's called GOMO, General Officer Management Office. And Gomo said, General Bostic, um, call in to let you know that uh, we are moving you to recruiting command. And I said, excuse me, I, I think you have the wrong person because I'm not moving anywhere. I just got back from 15 months in Iraq. I bought a house. My wife's got a job as a principal. I am not moving. And they said, well, we failed recruiting uh, for the first time in many years. And we'd like you to go out there and fix the recruiting problem. I said, did anybody ever tell you I've never served in recruiting? I'm an engineer. I've never served in recruiting. I don't know anything about it. And oh, by the way, we just bought a house. My wife's got a job. I cannot move. And they said, we know all that. Uh, we need you there in two weeks. And I hung up the phone. I packed up. I had a little one bedroom apartment. And they told me you're going to stay there for 18 months, turn recruiting around, and we're going to bring you back and send you to a division. 48 months later, I come home. <laughs> so I was a geographical bachelor for all that time, but it was one of the best jobs I ever had in my life. And I went there kicking and screaming, but we learned about, this is the only job that's kind of like business, I, I would say, having been in business and having to live under quarterly earnings reports and having shareholders. So, so in recruiting command, um, I had like a, a half a billion dollar budget. I worked with McCann Erickson in New York City, the big marketing ad agency. We changed our slogan from Army of One to Army Strong. We worked with NASCAR, professional bull riding, um, the National Hot Rod Association. We did the U.S. Army American All-American Bowl. Uh, I went to colleges and universities all across America and in high schools. And every month we had a mission of bringing in a certain number of soldiers. In the couple months I missed that, uh, my my shareholders, Congress, uh, called me up to testify on why I was so messed up and why, you know, I was incompetent, can't do it. You know, you've got to figure this out. You can't let the Army fail the recruiting mission. So, um, 
So anyway, uh, we, we, we changed a lot of the things that we did out there. I eventually became the head of personnel for the Army, and, and, and then I became the chief engineer. So that whole um, piece of being a personnelist for seven years, I didn't expect, but I loved it. And, and then I, the next thing I, I think I, I never aspired to be a general and I never aspired to be the chief engineers. It just sort of happened. So, um, but I wanna tell you something that's a good lesson, I think for all of us in, in leadership when I was in um, recruiting command. This is how important recruiting the army was at that time. And if for, I'm going to get to Mike Mullen here, Admiral Mullen, in just a minute. He was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs. If I forget, Jason, remind me. But I got to okay. tell you this one story. I had a, I was in Las Vegas at one of our recruiting stations, and one of the soldiers came up to me, ran up to me, a big smile, and said, "Hey, sir, I'm wondering if you can help me get back to Iraq." And I said, "Sure. I mean, we need a lot of troops in Iraq. When when were you last there?" Um, he says, oh, I got back two months ago. I said, wait a minute, you got back two months ago, you're in recruiting and you already wanna go back? He said, sir, uh, Iraq's better. Iraq and Afghanistan is better than recruiting. It's easier. And I go, what are you talking about? And he said, sir, do you know how many people I have to talk to in order to get one person to come in the army? And you all think about this, think about it. just you know, just in your head. How many people did that soldier have to talk to to get one person in the army. And, and I said, no, I don't know. You know. I'm barely new to this business. He said, well, sir, let me tell you this. Have you ever been to a dance in, a, in high school? I, I said, yeah, I've been to dances in high school and in college. He goes, well, how would you feel if you had to ask 149 women to dance before the 150th one would say yes? that's my job. I have to talk to 150 people to bring one person in the army. Please send me back to Iraq. And I said, I said, no, you're not going. So, but anyway, so it, this job, this, I didn't really realize how important it was until we had a new chairman and his name was Admiral Mullen, Mike Mullen. And, and when a new person comes on board, where they visit, in the first 30 days says a lot about their concern. So Admiral Mullen gets on an airplane, flies into Iraq, gets back on the airplane, flies into, um, um, into Afghanistan, talks to the troops there, and then flies into recruiting command. <laughs> you know, I had a big meeting in Boulder, Colorado, and I had all my leaders out there. And he said, Tom, you know, this is an important mission and, and you got to let me know if you need anything, I'm going to be here. So, so, and he was coming to the army because the army was the biggest. So, so he set a priority and leaders have to do that. They, they have to set priorities and then they have to be present. So, so, so he showed up and, but here's the biggest thing that, that made a difference. I, I, I think I, I never heard from him. I hear from him now and again, but during my military career, I didn't hear from him again until Don't Ask, Don't Tell, which is another story. But, um, but a year later, we had accomplished the mission. I'm in my hotel room and my, my cell phone goes off. And Tom, I said, yes, who is this? It's Mike. I said, Mike, Mike Mullen, Chairman Mike Mullen. He goes, yeah, yeah, Tom, how you doing? I said, I'm doing well. He said, great job on the mission. Great job. Real proud of you. And that was it. He hung up. But, you know, I think that means so much, you, you know, for a leader when 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 the priority goes well or something goes well, that you're present. It's also important when things go badly. When And I, and I can tell you a story about General Shinseki later that where, th you know, his presence during the toughest of times and being there to make a difference your presence and, and your communication really matter. So yeah, now, now here's the other thing about being come the chief of engineers. I was the head of personnel for the army and we were working a number of different challenges from um, the don't ask, don't tell, which I'm happy to talk about if you guys are interested. Uh, we were trying to get opportunities for women in the army at that time so that they, you know, we had not given them the kind of opportunities that needed. We had Sikhs that were wanting to come in the army and wear turbans and their beards and 
have their religious, religious accommodations recognized. So there were all these challenges we were working in, and, and we were successful in, in all of those, I thought. Um, and then my, and then I was asked to go to the Corps of Engineers and, and that was a great honor. And I, I learned a lot from that. And that, that also is like running a business on the outside. And I can talk about that. Yes, sir. I think that's, well, for one, I think uh, it's also worth noting, you know, one of, one of Admiral Mullen's stops was at Columbia University during those years um, as he was, uh, saw how important it was uh, to take the message to the American people about what the military was doing on its behalf. And so, uh, yeah, I think where he placed his priorities and, and his engagement, not only uh, overseas in the fight, but with the people who had to support us was definitely notable. Um, I do want to follow up then on, you know, you've mentioned several of the, of the items that are kind of on everyone's minds. And that's diversity and inclusion. Um, you know, people have seen the military generally as a leader uh, in diversity and inclusion efforts, um, at least around the 90s uh, and early 2000s. Um, but as we look at the numbers, um, there's some very stubborn numbers in the senior ranks. Right? The number of uh, minority officers in the senior ranks of the military, um, despite having increasing numbers, even from the 80s and 90s, you know, there seems to be a ceiling uh, where we don't ever break much above 8% in the senior ranks. What I would ask is, what have you learned, right? There's obviously been a lot of success, uh, but there's also still a long way to go. Uh, and where would you place the military in nationwide efforts to be inclusive and fair and optimize the talents we have uh, what can it learn from the civilian sector and what can it teach? Yeah, um, great. Um, so I'm gonna tell you, um, I wrote an article for CNN, the CNN opinion poll, it was on racism in the army. And some of you may have seen it, you don't need to look at it now, but at, at some point you might wanna look at it. But the reason I'm telling you that is because I'm an engineer, so I don't write a lot, but I, I was, just with the George Floyd thing happening, I felt like I had to write about this. So, so I wrote about it. And then I was getting ready to write another one on talent management, and diversity and inclusion. And, and Forbes called me and they said, hey, we saw your article and we wonder if you'd be a Forbes contributor. And I said, what? <laughs> and they said, what's that? And they said, well, we, we'd like you to write for us. And, and I said, I'm an engineer. <laughs> you know, my, my high school principal, principal and my English teacher, they're probably rolling over <laughs> right now, chuckling that somebody's asking me to write anything. He goes, no, no, we like the article, right? So I wrote, so now I write for Forbes and I, I have to really work at it, but I wrote one for 9-11. And then I just wrote one on talent management and talked about General C.Q. Williams and, uh, so, um, so, so, um, the, that was in, uh, the first time in, in that article that I just wrote, it was the first time an African American had been selected as a service chief. And, and what that means is, uh, th there's been a lot of African Americans, uh, I wouldn't say a lot, but there's been a number of African Americans that have risen to the ranks of, of uh, four-star general general officers, but but not uh, as many have or none have risen to the rank of of service chief. And a service chief is the top guy in the service, whether it's the Air Force, the Army, the Marines, or the Coast Guard. Um, so so anyway, when when this happened, it's actually I, I meant I said CQ Williams, I meant CQ Brown. So when General C.Q. Brown became the first African-American chief of a service branch, it was huge. I mean, and, and he was on the front of, you know, he's one of, I think he was on the front of Time Magazine. And now you all remember General Colin Powell, he was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs. So you have the top guy is a chairman and then, then the service chiefs, we've never had an African-American there. Even General Powell wasn't, he was the chairman of the service chiefs, but he wasn't a service chief. So when Brown did this, it, it you know it was it was huge, and so I I wrote a little bit about it, but I, I didn't know 
I didn't know his history, so I, I didn't know how to write about it. So I wrote about my own history to try to give the reader, readers an understanding of the challenges and, and why you have to manage talent very, very closely. So I'll, I'll tell you the story I wrote about, but when I was sent over to the Corps of Engineers, I was told that I had to fix the diversity problem that we had in the Corps of Engineers. And I really never thought about it. I, I you know, just kept my head down, did my job. I, I you know, tried to help anybody that needed help. And I didn't think about myself. I know what I look like, but I didn't think myself as, you know, diversity or a lone single person in, in this big million man and woman army. So when I went over to the Corps of Engineers, I, I brought in the 25 generals and there was one Caucasian female general and there was me, that, that was it. So I then understood what they were saying. So, so then I called in the 42 colonels and the lieutenant colonels. These are the ones that could fleet up that were in the Corps of Engineers. Now we had other people that were in the, the bigger army, but in the Corps of Engineers, there were 42 colonels and lieutenant colonels. There was one African-American female. So then I said, okay, well, let me start early. I, let, let me start with the people that have been in around eight years, captains. And what I'm gonna do is have the 25 generals call the top 25 captains and tell them they ought to do things like what Jason and I did, do a White House fellowship, be an Olmstead scholar, come to Washington and work in the Pentagon, get that corporate level experience and, and, and then grow to become a senior leader because that's what you have to do. So. Um, I got the list of the 25 best captains in the army, and there was one female and there was one African American. And then I, West Point called me to come to West Point, welcome the 127 cadets that picked the engineer branch. Um, and now I'm keenly aware of my pipeline. <laughs> it's pretty empty. <laughs> so um, I didn't even know when I graduated that I was the only one in my class that we didn't have women at the time, so I, I was it. I was the diversity in the engineer branch. And then I looked at the, the four years that I was at West Point, and there were six. Six African-Americans came in the Army, in the Corps of Engineers. You know, two of them made general, me and a guy named Ron Johnson. Um, so now I'm keenly aware. I walk in, there's 127. I look at these, these folks, and there are two people, two African-American cadets. So... I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna go back to when I was younger and this is in the article too. When I was younger I, as a Lieutenant Colonel and I didn't know this, but I was walking at the National Training Center and I had my, my breakfast with me. And, and, and as I was walking, there was a guy, he was, he was doing this. He was just, <laughs> and I said, what are you looking at? He said, I'm looking at you, sir. And I, I okay, I, I got it, you're looking at me, but why are you staring at me like that? And he said, were you the only one? I said, I'm the only one what? He said, you're the only brother in command in this whole division. So division's got like 25,000 soldiers in, in the commanders at the lieutenant colonel level. There's probably about 50 to 55 of those. And I was one of those commanders and I was the only one. Now he wasn't an engineer, he was an artillery guy, <laughs> but, but he, was, he was looking at me like, and, and then he, he walked away and he, he, he yelled, he goes, hey, sir, we're really proud of you. And I looked at him and I, I said, you know, my dad was a non-commissioned officer and I'm really proud of you. And then he walked another five, 25 yards away and he yelled and he said, hey, sir. And I said, what? And he says, don't get out. And I thought, don't put that on me. You know, <laughs> I was supposed to be gone a long time ago. I'm not supposed to be here. I was supposed to leave after five years, but I always thought about that guy. And when I got to West Point, I took out a couple cards and I walked up to those two guys, the hundred out of the hundred twenty-seven. I said, "Don't get out." And if you think about getting out, you're gonna have to call me. <laughs> now I don't know if they ever got out, but they sure didn't call me. But you think about an army with a million soldiers, and that's your pipeline. And I will tell you, the the female pipeline was exactly, or not exactly, but just as bad. I mean, there was, if not worse. I mean, so I managed that population really closely. Now, now here's something I'm gonna tell you of why when you're a leader, it's it, whatever you believe, it doesn't matter if the organization doesn't believe it. So, so if it's not in the culture, if it's not in the roots of the organization, 
You can believe what you want to believe, but you can't stop bad things from happening. So here's, I'm going to give you two examples. I, I was the head of personnel for the Army, and I, I um, it was Christmas time, and I was walking around, you know, patting people on the back, and this, this African-American NCO asked me if I would autograph this, this picture. And so I, I autographed it and I said, who's that? He goes, he said, that's my son, sir. Real proud, you know, big smile. And I said, he's an engineer. And he said, uh, he said, yes, sir. He's really a en great engineer. I said, tell him not to get out. And if he ever needs anything, tell him to give me a call. <laughs> Here's my card. Well, he needed something right then, but his dad wasn't going to tell me. So I, the next year I'm the chief engineers and an African-American general who knows I'm focused on this pipeline calls me up and says, you know, I got this young African-American captain, he's gonna get out. And uh, you know him, his dad was an enlisted soldier, worked for you when you were the G1. He goes, oh yeah, I, I remember that. And what's the problem? And he goes, well, well, he got into MIT last year and MIT wanted to give him a free ride to study industrial engineering. Uh, but the Army said he couldn't go. They, they needed him uh, for some other assignment. So he saluted, drove on, and, and now this general says he's my aide. Now to be an aide, you got to be pretty good. So uh, he applied again to MIT, and MIT said, hey, same, same deal. He comes here, and, and, and it's a free ride. Army doesn't need to pay for anything. And the Army had this selection board, and he missed the cutoff, you know, because these guys are all very good, and he misses the cutoff by two. So he was going to get out because he didn't think, you know, MIT would do the same thing the next year. So I called up MIT and, or I called up uh, the, the branch that did this. And I said, what's the problem? And he says, well, sir, he's got two people in front of him. And I said, OK, do those two people have scholarships to anywhere else in the world where the Army doesn't have to pay? I said, well, well, no, sir, nobody on the list has a scholarship. The Army has to pay for everybody. I said, I think we can figure this out, can't we? So the guy goes to MIT. And three years later, I'm, I'm at a conference speaking and the professor from MIT speaks and then he comes and talks to me. He says, you know, you guys sent this captain up and he's an African-American. He got a 4-0 average. He's the best student in our class. If you have any more, please send him our way. I said, you have no idea how hard that was. But this is what I'm, I'm saying. It's, it, it, you, you have to figure out. So I was tracking everything, not by name, but by numbers. So here's one on a female. I had a friend that was a classmate of mine, went to Harvard Business School after West Point. And so he mentored West Point or Harvard students. And he called me up and said, hey, you're about to lose a, a, a female. Um, and she's pretty bright. And I said, well, what's the story? And she says, well, she was told by her boss. Again, this is that mid-level leader. So it's the Lieutenant Colonel Chrisman, who I had, versus Lieutenant Colonel, whoever he was, that told her she had no future in the engineer branch. Now I'm the chief engineers. I could have, I could have done anything, you know. And the senior people, not illegal, but but just like with this MIT guy, we, we can we can make this work. Don't do something stupid. Well, unbeknownst to me, this lieutenant colonel tells her she has no future, so she decides she wants to go to psychological operations. And my friend said, okay, what else can you do? Well, well she graduated from Harvard. She went to ROTC at MIT, and she's a Rhodes Scholar. I said, okay, enough. So I called up my branch. I said. Send me the female road scholar. <laughs> they said, "Sir, we, we only have two road scholars in our in our whole corps of engineers, and they're both male." So I called my buddy. Can I get her so social security number? I get it. I call up HRC. They call me back, sir. She transferred to psychological operations last month. And I said, "You know," and this is what I'm talking about. It, I I can believe all of what I want. So, so that's why the leaders got to get out there and. Mm -hmm. You, you got to get it into the culture. You got to get it into the roots of the organization. So what you believe is really what every other leader believes. And they act out on that. Uh, because if you're the senior person, you, you have some flexibility. I can change policies. I learn how to change laws. I mean, you can do a lot of things if you're senior, but you can't do anything if people are making decisions that go against the culture or against the direction you're trying to move an organization. It's interesting, sir. You know, you bring up the uh, you know one of the fundamental tensions. Uh, you know, the military you know, personnel system largely established during the industrial era uh, to look at you know numbers uh, and not people. Um, on a 
large scale. I guess to, to transition a little bit uh, into, you know, the differences between military and civilian leadership, right? There's, there's certainly strengths to military leadership about um, bringing people along, uh, mentoring, coaching, at least when you're directly interacting. Uh, but then there's also not much in the way of uh, talent management versus personnel management. Um, we're also often challenged, right? The Everybody wants to hear about the WASTA of uh, military leadership, but often military leaders are also not responsible for things like budgeting uh, or hiring and firing in a, in a direct capacity. Um, in the context of all that and the stories you've laid out, um, you know, I'd like to flip the usual question and not say, you know, how do, how do, how should military leadership translate to the civilian world? But what have you learned about leadership in the civilian world and in your time working with much smaller, uh, less established organizations? Uh, what lessons have you gleaned uh, from those that, you know, you'd like to take back into the military or that just you've personally grown from? Yeah, it's a great question. And, you know, I, I think uh, the military can learn from the corporate world and, and vice versa. And one of the things that um, I tried to work against um, was the bureaucracy that we have, that you have lieutenants and you have captains and it works its all the way up to the, to the general. And rarely is the, the general gonna reach down and talk to somebody junior. I mean, they've got to work their way through the funnel. And, and I've had some, some of my best successes in the army and in the corporate world is, is this diversity of thought. So not necessarily ethnic diversity, but, but having people that really think very differently. Um, and sometimes it's because they're young and sometimes young, smart, and very talented in some areas. Like my son is a so, and like many of you, they're social media kind of guru, and and I'm a social media kind of dinosaur. So so if you're trying to do things in social media and you don't have young folks in in the room, I mean really present, then 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 that can be challenging. So when I was uh, in my biotech world, it's fast moving, thousand people publicly traded, but, but the CEO would from time to time just call right down to a scientist in, in Belgium. You know? Hey, what can you tell me about this? I think that's great. I, you know, we had our challenges in that company and I won't go into them because we were publicly traded. But, um, but I think this idea of, of bringing people into the room so that they can, or into the conversation so they can add that difference of thought and opinion. I saw this in government too. You, you come to Washington, and I would encourage you, if any of those he, here, we, we need business people to apply for White House fellowships, and Jason and I, it's the greatest leadership program, I think, in the world, um, but, but we need young people to continue to apply and compete for that, and we need folks with, with a business background, because I think business adds to what the bureaucracy needs in order to make decisions like you see in the corporate world, but in, in the political world, You'll have a lot of young people that will come in, and and they'll 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 have all these great ideas. There's, there's a guy I worked with, Ali Zaidi, and he's very young. He's probably going to be, uh, he'll be in the Democratic um, front runner for some of these positions. But he and I work together. I'm probably 20, 25 years older than him, but it, it doesn't matter. He, you know, he's a smart guy. He's technically got it. Um, so so I think that's one of the the things that I really appreciate and value. And, and, and I think the other thing is really different experiences. The, the army, it's like a tribe and you know, we like to, we like the people we know and the people that have done what we've done. Um, you know, if you're in the infantry or the ranger tribe, you, you know, you, you kind of know what rangers have done. So you kind of feel comfortable with them. And same thing with me. And I think you have to do just the opposite to build a, a, a cohesive and su successful team. And, um, you know, you've got to bring in these very, very capable people that have done something totally different than you. And you, you don't know any, anything other than the, the very capable person and you bring them into the audience. I, I, I think corporate world does that better. That's my sense. 
um, than than a bureaucracy might do. There's a uh, there's an interesting related question that some of our our uh, attendees have been asking, right? And it's about ethical leadership. And to tie it into what you just said, I think there's always a tension, right, between team building, you build a tribe, uh, and that's great. And it can become kind of a motivating, unifying force. But there's also a tipping point where um, tribes start to cover for themselves, particularly when it comes to ethical behavior. You know, everybody looks the other way if, you know, the boss uh, takes a cut or somebody makes a mistake, um, you know, they're much more, more ready to excuse a member of their tribe. How do you, how do you manage that balance? Uh, in especially when it comes to ethics and standards, um, you know, this team building versus covering for your team. Um, and, you know, is it, is it a top down thing? Is it bottom up? How do you infuse ethics uh, for organizations, and particularly in the type of civilian organizations you're working in now? Yeah, um, it, it's very it's very challenging. I I think back to our experience at at West Point. You know, um, we had a an honor code that said you wouldn't lie, cheat, or steal, nor tolerate anyone that does. And so so if you're if you're a classmate and a friend. Uh, cheated or did something inappropriate, then, then you, you had to, you had to turn them in or, or you would be tolerating that. So it was a stiff, stiff penalty. And, and, and one of my aides, <laughs> one of my aides was very bright and, and she was a West Pointer and she wasn't my aide when she was a West Pointer, but when she was a West Pointer, there was an incident that happened and she did not want to turn in uh, one of her fellow classmates. And what she knew what happened, she ended up having to do a fifth year. Um, and she did that fifth year at West Point. And, and then I was looking for the, one of the top women to be my aide. Now I was chief of engineers. It turned out to be this, this female. And we talked about this story and the superintendent that made the decision she wasn't going to kick, get kicked out of West Point, but stay another year was General Christman. So, so, and I, I walked up, I told him he made the right decision because she's like one of the best officers I have ever met uh, in this particular job. And, and she's going to, she's going to do great things. But I think, you know, you can't force that kind of culture that we had at, at West Point because it, it's hard for everybody to live under it. I, I did something, you know, when I was, we were a cadet, we had to sign a piece of paper. So if you wrote a paper and you asked your mate, um, how do you spell Shakespeare? You know, and, and, you, and he gave it to you, then you literally had to say, I got help from my roommate on how to spell, uh, spell Shakespeare. It was that <laughs> draconian. So uh, when I was a senior, we had this project that was due and this guy never participated. I call him up and he, he just never, part and now it was time to turn in the paper. And he, he came to sign this paper that said, this was our work. And I said, well, you can't sign it because you, you didn't do anything. And he goes, well, I was busy. I said, listen, you know, I, I can't let you sign this thing. And he goes, well, then I won't graduate. And I said, that's not my problem. And um, it turns out he graduated, but a half a year later, so he had to go to summer school and he had to do this. And I always thought this guy, my whole time in the army, I thought he was looking for me. And the, we were gonna walk, I was gonna walk down a dark alley <laughs> and there he was gonna be. And, you know, 30 years later, he's very wealthy and he's done very well. And we were at a football game and he came up to me and he says, hey, you did the right thing, you, you know? But it, it's, it's a hard thing to do, I, I think. But, you know, in the general officer, ranks we have a we have a a 360 in the 360 amongst generals they're all supposed to be pretty good but we still have guys that are on the margins of really really good or they have some issues some some ethical issues and we're hoping that some of that comes up out of that 360 so so that's one way to get at it but i i think that the tribe thing it's a it's a great question jason i i don't know uh 
uh, the best way to do it, 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 but it gets back to culture. Uh, we had a culture at West Point that was hoisted upon us that I, in retrospect, I thought it was really hard to live by. We all tried to. And I think in, in society, in civilian organizations, you have to inculcate that belief. But I, I, I think it can't be so much that if you break it, you know, there's hopefully a way to recover that, that you can get this fifth year to train or you can graduate a year later, but you learn from the mistake and, and it's not a career ender that, that people make mistakes all the time. And I, that's what I love about the United States. You can, you can come back from being knocked down. It doesn't mean your, your, your career's over, your life's over. And I, and I think make it an inclusive environment that people can make mistakes and recover. Yeah, it's certainly it's a it's a tough and it's a tough boundary, and I think um, at least military cat is moving away from some of that draconianness and you know us old crusty people uh, sometimes bitch about it, but I do think the uh, you know this idea of growth, uh, you know, e ethical growth is not a black and white thing, right? It's you're not born with it; you actually do have to learn it and work at it. Um, moving from I guess this, these difficult questions of um, yeah, ethics and leadership per se, uh, to, you know, the next really difficult, uh, question and challenge facing us is, uh, and also relates to the idea of tribalism, right? We're in a very tough spot in the United States right now. Uh, business leaders who, you know, heretofore have wanted to stay, you know, kind of out of the political fighting, find themselves dragged in at various times on various sides. Uh, you know, Pfizer, you know, are they working for the president? Are they working against the president? Um, you've been in two organizations or two programs that have resolutely at least attempted to be nonpartisan, not nonpolitical, but nonpartisan. And that would be obviously the United States military, which tries to serve the American people, regardless of the party in power, uh, as well as White House Fellows Program, which is set up to bring public servants uh, to the top levels of the government uh, in a non-political way. Obviously, you're doing political things, but to kind of try to maintain that balance of nonpartisanship. As you've navigated from those experiences now into the business world, uh, and you're right in the middle of biotech and bioengineering, and obviously everybody, there's a laser focus on, on what you, your companies and others are doing. I guess, can you talk broadly or specifically about, you know, how do you, one, how do you try to balance, you know, this increasingly tribal partisan world, both as an individual and as a business leader? Uh, and then what do you, what, what do you think is our, our path forward as Americans and our way out of this? Yeah. <laughs> do you have any easy questions, Jason? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just asking you, know, you to solve the world, sir. Yeah, no. Um, you know, I think you have to engage. You, you have to be in the arena. You have to engage. You have to be part of the debate. You, you have to have thick skin. Um, and you have to continually learn. It, it's a learning environment. I, I'm working with four companies that are trying to help with COVID. So when I came out of the military, um, this multi-billionaire called me up and he says, you know, we, we build better DNA and we'd like you to come work for us. And I said, well, I build better dams. What do we have in common other than three letter words that starts with D? Uh, and, and he chuckled and he says, well, we want to change the world. We want to you know, there are going to be 2 billion more people on the planet. And, you know, we, we've got to have better food, energy, better cancer products and food products and, and um, environment. And we want you to leave the environment sector. So I, I came into that. I did that for four years. And then when I, I, I left that company and COVID started because I knew the federal government space pretty well. And I knew biotech, these companies came to me to, to try to get help. One of the companies... I, I said, hey, you know, I know General Kelly, because I thought it was this was a national security issue in this one company because they had been told to build a certain type of factory. They'd been given $45 million from the NIH to build this factory. And, um, and, and this factory was gonna be testing. 
one of their competitors were bought by the Chinese. The, the, they really had no competitors, but one of them that was a close competitor, the Chinese bought them. And you can look this up, it's the company's BGI. They, they took BGI, the Chinese company, gave them a billion and a half dollars and said, make these testing facilities rapidly. So, so we're trying to build one testing facility and it might be ready in March. And um, it'll test about 200,000 people a day, which is a lot. And this may be dated, but when I read about it two weeks ago, the Chinese have built 58 of these facilities in 18 countries and they're offering free testing to 118 countries. So they're gonna dominate the supply chain uh, uh, just like they did with PPE and everything else. And we're gonna kind of turn around and wonder what happened to us. So I thought this was a national security thing. So I, I said, hey, I'm gonna, I typed up a letter <laughs> to send to the pre vice president because Keith Kellogg is, General Kellogg is his national security advisor. We go to church together. So I, so I said, hey, Keith, I'm, so before I sent it, I, I sent it to these guys and they said, no, you can't do that. <laughs> you, know, you can't, you know, because they're bidding on a billion dollar loan and they, they thought that, it, and I understand they thought that if you, if you look like you were putting pressure or you're getting any kind of favoritism, that that might come back to haunt us. And and then I got questions. Have you con contributed to any of the campaigns? Uh, who are you talking to? You know, the, the legal folks. So so it's kind of it, it is it is very difficult. And I, so I think one, it was helpful for me to understand where they stood, this company and their leadership, and what their concerns were. I could now now we're still going to go through the Pentagon and, and we're going to work the issue at a not so high level, but to try to get sensible people to say the we have a challenge here and we've got to do something about it. But, uh, but I think you, you, you just have to get in there and you have to hook and jab. And I used to tell the guys in the core, you know, it's like a punching bag and you just keep punching at it and punching at it, you stick with it and, and you're going to soften it up and then there's going to be a breakthrough. And, you know, I was, I, to give you an example of the kind of politics, it's not as, you know, when I came to Washington, you know, you had 535 members of Congress and in the middle, people that could be swayed one way or the other, there might be 200 people, you know, now that's like right. five, you know, it might be Susan Collins or Mitt Romney. It's just like, it's, you know, the everything else is decided and you've got, you know, less than five people in the middle. So it makes it very, very difficult to, to try to to try to do the right thing. But I think if you stay at the national level, you stay at the non, you know, state level and you try to do what's good for the nation, you, you know, where we're really good at this. So, so in times of war, we're really good. Everybody kind of weighs in, 9-11, we're all, we're all in. Uh, Katrina, uh, when, when uh, you know, people get devastated in New York City and, and Sandy, you know, we're all in. We're really good at those. The only other time I've seen us do this well don't ask, don't tell. That was divisive, but but we kind of came out. We we also did it during BRAC when we voted an up or down vote. So it can happen. I've seen it happen, but you got to just stick with it. It's there's no easy way to to make this work. And I, and I think we need the business community because the business community thinks in a way that the government doesn't. I I the thing I learned the most was. <laughs> And I don't like quarterly earnings, um, you know, in a public trading company, especially when your stock goes down after you say something. <laughs> but uh, but I think you got to, that's the st shareholders holding us accountable and saying, now, take the shorts out of it, because the short sellers, you know, those guys, they drive things completely haywire. I, part of me thinks that ought to be illegal. But but anyway, still, I, I think to have to answer to your shareholders and, and say, this is what we're doing, why we're doing it. It is a good thing. And I think the government doesn't have to do that enough. They should have to answer to the American people, to the Congress in a way that is not partisan. Well, we certainly have a, have, have a ways to go, uh, but thankful that you're in the fight and helping bridge you know, the gap between politics, uh, business, and the military. Uh, we're actually out of time um, we'll come back for another hour uh, at a later date uh, and solve all the world's problems. Uh, but I wanted to say thank you, sir, for all of this, uh, for your continued insights, your leadership, uh, and your willingness to spend so much time 
uh, with the collective group here today. I know we have you know, a lot of folks who are trying to navigate <clears throat> their own paths uh, and seeing such a unique, uh, diverse and meaningful path from someone like yourself uh, can't be overstated how important it is uh, for this cohort. Uh, and I hope you stay in touch uh, with Columbia at large, Columbia Business School uh, and everyone here as well. And so on behalf of everyone, thank you very much for your, your 38 plus years of service and for your continued service to this nation and for your time with us today. Well, thank you very much, Jason. It's been a, a great opportunity. And, and I, I thank you students for continuing to study and the faculty for what you're doing to, to help uh, the students. And I, I just, you know, the military is not for everyone. I, I, I want to thank those that are veterans and those that serve and, and those that help those that serve. Uh, but I, there's, there's a lot of different ways to help the country. And I think each of us find our own path to that. Uh, and I would ask that you, you know, the government can be very frustrating, but if there's a way that you can contribute and, and be part of that process, whether it's at the local level, the state level, or the federal level, uh, or, you know, I love education, like I said, and fourth grade is kind of my grade. And if, if, you can, if you can help with the education side of things and spend some time, I, I really wish that there was a way in, in our government where, you know, they could, they could pay for all your MBAs and you could go spend a certain amount of time and it could be part-time, but, but you could spend a certain amount of time helping out because uh, we need bright people like those in the audience that can help us tackle those sorts of issues. And I've proposed this a number of times to try to find a way to to get our, our talented folks and to give back in a way that's not military, may not even be government, but it's a way that makes a difference for society. So as you think about where your path may, may go, um, we will certainly need you in the fight in, in some part of the many issues that we talked today. So thank you all very much. And I look forward to maybe one day being in Columbia uh, to see you face to face for a cup of coffee. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.